Well, welcome to this evening's lecture, The Postmodern, A Post American World and the Rise of the Rest. <laughs> it might be. And welcome especially to our speaker, Farid Zakaria. Farid Zakaria, as you all know, is editor of News Inter Newsweek International and has established a deserved reputation as one of the world's foremost commentators on international affairs. He writes a regular column for Newsweek, which also appears in Newsweek International and the Washington Post, and hosts an international affairs program, which no doubt many of you have seen, Farid Zakaria's GPS, which airs weekly on CNN. He was born in India, India and educated at Yale and then Harvard, where he received his PhD. He's the former manager of foreign affairs and the author of several books, including The Future of Freedom, a New York Times bestseller, which has now been translated into 20 plus languages. He has won several awards for his columns and notable essays, and particularly for his 2001 Newsweek cover story, Why They Hate Us. In 2007, he was named one of the 100 leading public intellectuals in the world by Foreign Policy and Prospect magazines. He will speak this evening about the themes of his book, now published in paperback, and uh, originally published in 2008, and read on the campaign trail very publicly by one notable Barack Obama. The lecture this evening is sponsored, I should add, by Global Policy, which I very much hope uh, 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 to discuss with Farid later. It's a new innovative interdisciplinary journal which brings together world-class academics and leading practitioners, people seeking to make policy work, to analyze both public and private solutions to public issues, public goods, and public bans, and how to surmount public bans. It will be published in January 2010. The first issues come out in January 2010. It's an LSE-based journal, hence I'm dwelling on it. And uh, we very much hope we will welcome you to, we can welcome you to its pages. Farik Zakari will speak now for about 30, is that right, 30 to 40 minutes. And of course, we will then have questions. You've already given him a, a warm welcome. It's a warm night. I should congratulate all of you when you might have been out and about on a very warm night outside, coming to join us all this evening. So let's give him once again another very warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. It is such a pleasure to be here, to be back here, actually. Um, I was here last year, uh, and I hope to make it uh, something of a regular occurrence, if you will uh, indulge me. It was, it was great fun the last time. I have very fond memories of, uh, or, or uh, stories about the LSE from my father, who came to the LSE on a scholarship in 1944. The man who was the, the person on the ship said to him, you understand there's a war going on. He was coming from India. And he said, yeah, no, I know. Um, but uh, I guess such was the pull of, the, of a scholarship to the LSE uh, that he did it. Uh, I regret to say that what happened was he had a meeting with his advisor, Harold Lasky, who told him, young man, you're not really interested in economics. You're interested in history. Go to SOAS. So that's, <laughs> that's where he went and ended, ended up getting his PhD. Um, it's, it, as I said, a, a pleasure and honor to be here. What I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the world today and how I think the themes of my book interact with it. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to have read the book. Um, I, will, I, will, uh, I, I will not assume any, uh, any prior knowledge. But really to try to, exp to explain where we are and how we, how we get out of here as best I can. Um, and I think about it sometimes looking at uh, this extraordinary figure who has become the President of the United States, Barack Obama. A uh, young man decided to run for the presidency of, of the United States probably about three years ago. And when he was making that decision, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was 14,000. It is now 8,500 or something like that. Uh, the world was in the midst of this great global boom. And as he trudged onto the campaign trail in the plains of Iowa, and the uh, villages of New Hampshire, the only question being asked of any presidential candidate on the Democratic side was how, do you, how are you going to get us out of Iraq? Uh, this was the only issue on anybody's mind. Uh, in fact, that is in large part the reason Barack Obama came into the kind of prominence he did. Uh, it, it was because he had a compelling 
answer and he had a compelling story about it. And now here he is, President of the United States. And I think getting out of Iraq is a complicated issue and will take a great deal of care. But I think it's safe to say that this is probably item number 17 on Barack Obama's to-do list right now. He has to deal with the collapsed financial industry, the, uh, the mortgage industry, the housing sector, uh, the automobile sector, uh, not to mention all the other associated spillover effects on the, on the American economy. And then, of course, the crises of the moment, Iran, North Korea, before he gets to Iraq. And that is, in a sense, the strange life of uh, a, prime, a president or a prime minister. You, you, you campaign on certain issues, and then the world changes. But n never, I think, has it changed as much and as suddenly for any president as it did for, for Barack Obama. The only real comparison, ironically, is with Herbert Hoover who campaigns and comes into office uh, in the 1929, assuming an era of, uh, of unbreakable prosperity, and very soon the United States has the Great Crash and the Great Depression. Let's hope the stories don't end in similar ways for Barack Obama and Herbert Hoover. Um, many of, much of the commentary around the, the crisis, I find, has tended to take on a highly moralistic flavor. Uh, this is understandable, there's a huge crisis, a trauma, and people assume that it must be because some, somebody did very evil things. And the, the narrative that has taken shape in the United States, and I suspect, and I, and I know in large part in Britain as well, is that, we, you know, that these demon bankers destroyed the world economy. And there's some truth to that, but I think as with any complex historical phenomenon, uh, there's often more to it than that. And what I want to tell is the story of why I think there's more to it than, than that, and uh, therefore, more importantly, how to think about the fixes. Because if the, if the, if the answer were merely that there were demon bankers and we just need a better, cl better class of bankers, uh, I think we're going to find, wait long and hard for this solution to, uh, to, to, to take effect. But if, in fact, it is a more complicated uh, process that got us into this, then we, we can start scratching at the surface for the solutions. I think, at some fundamental level, the, pro the reason we're in the mess we're in is actually not a product of failure, but a product of success. And let me explain what I mean. You have to bear with me, because I'm, I'll, I'll retell a little history. Uh, it begins in 1979. 1979 is a pretty tough year for the United States. The American economy is in bad shape. Stagflation is a term that was coined then to describe the combination of high unemployment and high inflation. It's also geopolitically doing badly. It's a few years after the humiliation of Vietnam, the, the agony of Watergate. And other countries, most importantly the Soviet Union, are taking advantage of this. The Soviet Union is pressing forward in Central America, in Africa, in Southeast Asia. And it is doing so because you will recall that in the late 1970s, oil prices were very high. In fact, 1979 was the peak year of oil prices until oil crossed $130 a barrel, which, which happened briefly um, in 2008. Now, the Soviet Union, flush with oil revenues, because it was in some ways a petro-dictatorship, uh, decides to go on a series of foreign policy adventures, funding all kinds of guerrilla, guerrilla movements. Uh, but most importantly, what it does uh, at this moment of great apparent triumph is it invades Afghanistan. And in doing so, and in more generally having an expansionist foreign policy, it begins the process of digging its own grave. It breaks the back of the Soviet empire, it bankrupts the Soviet system, and eventually leads to the collapse of the Soviet Union itself. 1979 is in some sense the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. They never really are able to recover after that. And that winding down of the Cold War ushers in an extraordinary period of stability, political stability around the world. Now, this is probably not the way you think of it because you have images of, you know, chaos, terrorism, bombs going off, and you feel as though you live in very dangerous times. That is, alas, one of the, the uh, realities of the information revolution, which is that everything is happening instantaneously in front of your eyes, and it I say this as somebody who does a show for CNN, there is a tendency toward exaggeration and hype. Um, 
you know, I mean, you only have to watch the Weather Channel, at, at least in America. I don't know if there is an equivalent in Britain, but whenever I watch the Weather Channel, I'm always struck by how much more dramatic the weather is on TV <laughs> than it appears to be outside. You know, it uh, looks like a cloudy day, and suddenly you discover the thunderstorms. If there's a, th a hurricane, it, it, it's the hurricane of the decade. It's the typhoon of the millennium. And then, of course, you think to yourself, they're trying to get you to keep watching. Well, unfortunately, that's true for news networks as well. And there is a tendency to treat every bomb, every terror, terrorist attack that, ta that take, ha takes place as a you know, seismic event. There is actually very good data on, on the question of whether or not there has been more political stability in the world in the last 20 years. And the University of Maryland, among um, other, a couple of other places, collects the data. And violence as a result, uh, deaths as a result of violence that is political in nature, that is to say wars, civil wars, and terrorism, yes, terrorism, uh, have declined like this over the last 30 years. The decline is very, very steep, and it is a secular line going, going, down, going back over 25 years. Now, it really makes sense if you think about the fact that 30 years ago, the Soviet Union was funding, arming, all kinds of guerrilla movements, militias, and governments all over the world. And the United <laughs> States and its Western allies were funding the other side of every one of those movements. So that that intense superpower proxy struggle that found its way into the corners of Southeast Asia, in Africa, in the jungles of Central America, that all started winding down, largely because the Soviet Union ran out of cash, and after that, because the Soviet Union itself disappeared. If you look at that world, three and a half million people die in Indochina in the early 70s, two million people die in the Middle East, four million people die in Africa in the late 80s and early 90s. That world has largely died out. There are terrible things going on in the world. There are places where there are grave injustices. There are places where there are significant casualties. But the simple fact is, in terms of raw numbers, there is a, st a stunning decline. There is another very striking uh, element to this, which is, in 1986, a very famous American historian, uh, John Lewis Gaddis, wrote a, uh, an essay called The Long Peace, in which he pointed out that at that point, 1986, it had, been a gener it had been 40 years since there had been a great power war, and that that 40-year period was the longest period in modern history where you had not had a war between the great powers. Well, a generation later, not only has the long peace endured, but in fact, you can add to it another caveat, which is there is currently no significant military political competition among the great powers of the world, which is, a, which is actually unique in history. You have never had a situation where there is not serious and sustained military political competition uh, among the great powers. I know that there's a little bit of it here and there relating to Georgia uh, and the Ukraine, perhaps relating to Taiwan, but it really pales in comparison to any serious historical precedent. So you look at that world and you say, this is truly extraordinary. You know, in a, a atmosphere of political stability and peace that has really never existed before, year after year. Then you have another seismic event, which, is an e which, is, which produces economic stability. In the late 1970s, the biggest problem every country had was inflation. Inflation rates were the highest in, in, in memory and in, in history in the United States. But that was nothing compared with, you know, Brazil had 1,000% inflation. Turkey had 2,000% inflation. Uh, Peru had 3,000% inflation. And inflation, uh, hyperinflation, is socially very disruptive. It is much more disruptive than, say, um, recessions and unemployment produced by recessions. Uh, a, a recession robs you of what you might have had in terms of rising salaries, rising you know, bonuses, a better job, if, the, if growth continued. But hyperinflation destroys what you already have. It is your savings. And it destroys fundamentally the middle class of a country, which is the backbone of stability. If you want to see this vividly, uh, the way in which you know, countries look at these things, uh, the G20 meeting in London, you had the United States and Germany operating from two very different historical memories and therefore coming to two very different historical conclusions. The United States, traumatized by the Great Depression, determined to make sure that there would never be that kind of high unemployment, 25% unemployment again, argues for massive fiscal stimulus, right? The Germans, traumatized by the hyperinflation of the 1920s, which destroys the Weimar Republic, destroys the German middle class, and leads to the rise of Nazism, 
are as adamant that they are not going to do something that will, that will tempt the, the fires of, fire, of hyperinflation. And if, if you think about that, that concern, that, that's what's going on in the 1970s, and which is why you have social revolutions all over the world, by the way, including in Iran. One of the, one of the con conditions that, uh, pre that antedated the, the Iranian revolution was very intense problems of inflation. Uh, all over Latin America, you had the same, uh, the same situation. So into that, uh, into that world steps Paul Volcker, appointed chairman of the Federal Reserve in 1979, which you will discover is my favorite year. Um, and Volcker clamps down on inflation, raises in interest rates very high, uh, and in doing so breaks the back of inflation in the United States. But in doing so also sets a precedent which other central bankers begin to learn from very quickly, and you have a kind of spillover effect around the world, which starts in 79, and you can be, see it moving from country to country. Mrs. Thatcher, for example, adopts tight money policies in, in the United uh, Kingdom, but all over the world. 1979, the number of countries that had hyperinflation was something like 35. Hyperinflation, by the way, is uh, sustained inflation over 15%. The number of countries that have hyperinflation today is one, Zimbabwe. Uh, and that tells you the, the extraordinary shift that's taken place. And what that has produced is enormous economic stability. Uh, economic stability extends people's horizons. It makes people plan for the future. It makes people feel confident about taking on debt. It makes them confident about you know, all the things that you, that you imagine you'll be able to do assuming economic and political stability. And to, to these two forces, economic transformation, uh, political transformation, economic transformation, add a third, which is the information revolution, which massively decentralizes power, but empowers people all over the world, and connects them in a way that has never happened before. Uh, it is often commonplace among academics to point out that the world is actually as globalized, only as globalized today as it was in 1914, the corollary being that there can be massive reversals. Um, the, the globalization of 1914 was a wholly different kind of globalization. Basically, it was a globalization based on trade. In, people in Britain made goods, they sold them to Germans. Germans made goods, they sold them to Brits. Globalization today is so completely different in character. You have an IBM work team that starts on a project in Armonk, New York. Uh, and when the day is finishing up in Armonk, the project is sent to the London office. And the London office begins working on it. When the London office closes, it goes to the Istanbul office. When the Istanbul office closes, that project sh is shipped over, uh, over the internet to the Bangalore office. From Bangalore, it goes to Shanghai, from Shanghai to Singapore, from Singapore to Los Angeles, and so on. And so I, I often uh, am puzzled when I watch the intense debates taking place in France about preserving the 35-hour work week, because I think to myself, the Indians and the Chinese are meanwhile perfecting the 35-hour work day. Um, <laughs> but it points to a kind of different, a, a different character and quality of globalization. These intense interconnected supply chains. A GE jet engine is today manufactured in 22 different countries. It's sold in 14 others. The, so the capital for it comes from God knows how many places, right? Uh, there's actually some, a very profound question about whether we even know whose GDP numbers those, the, that jet engine should go on in the first place. Uh, and I think this is a, a serious problem that economists, you know, assume away the, 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 the problems with, but it really is quite complex. You're using 19th century national income accounting to try and describe a very, very different world. That information revolution, completely connecting the world and providing inf instantaneous uh, information, produces a single global economy of a quality and character very different from, from any other. I mean, just to give you one flavor of it, because it, it, we, see, we see this in the news again over, over the last few weeks with Iran. In 1990, uh, the, uh, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. The country that is most rattled by this is Saudi Arabia, Kuwait's neighbor, because you figure if, you know, if Saddam Hussein is invading countries for oil, well, they might be next on the list. The Saudi regime, uh, which is governed as always by an 80-something-year-old man, um, I say as always because, you know, they have this snail space succession where it always goes to the next oldest brother, and they have like 65 of them. So it's almost by definition true that if you're ruling Saudi Arabia, you will be 80 plus. 
Um, and and the, uh, the, the, the aged monarch decides he needs some time to figure out what to do. And so he says, let's not tell the people that Iraq invaded Kuwait. And so for, for a week, actually nine days, the Saudis simply have a news blackout. Nobody in Saudi Arabia knows that their next door neighbor has been taken over by Saddam Hussein. If you think to yourself, in today's world, this is only 19 years ago, how long could even the Saudi monarchy keep a secret like that? Well, I would say probably something in the range of two to five minutes, right? Because even in Saudi Arabia today, you've got the BBC, you've got CNN, you've got Star, you've got uh, the internet, you've got you know, web pages, you've got um, mobile phones, right? I mean, what is the, 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 the organizing principle of Twitter is that you say, you know, you answer the question, what are, you, what, are, what are you doing right now? So some guy, all it needs is some guy in Kuwait to say, being invaded by Iraq, <laughs> and that's the end of your Saudi state secret, right? And we see this in Iran right now, where despite a regime that is very cut off from the world and has this extraordinary ability to control uh, at every level in an almost quasi-totalitarian way, uh, the system, they still can't stop the information getting out. They still can't stop people from even organizing. And in, in the only way you can do it is to shut down the entire internet or to shut down cellular networks. This, by the way, is the genius of Twitter, which is that it allows social networking to take place through cell phones rather than through the web. Because the laptop is a luxury in most developing countries. The cell phone is the personal computer of the third world. And so when you, when you are able to network using a, third, using a cell phone, you have suddenly truly created you know, a kind of empowerment process for billions, not just, not just hundreds of millions. You're not now talking about the people who have broadband in these countries. You're, you're talking about anyone who has a cell phone and anyone here who's been to a of, you know, to, to a rural Africa, you know that even they have cell phones. Um, so these three revolutions taking place simultaneously produce this new world. Uh, and they produce a world that is wholly different from the world than the one that, that preceded it, of political stability, economic stability, and a great degree of uh, global connectivity. And in producing this new global economy, we start creating the world that we have been living in. Uh, and it is a very different world. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, traveling around the world in the early 90s, I remember vividly these countries like India, like Brazil, that had all been mu you know, much closer to the Soviet Union in their, in their political economy, trying to figure out what it meant to be part of this new world. How did you, how did you make, it, make it work? Uh, and they all start trying to find their way. And the great story of the era we live in, I believe, uh, when the historians write about it, a hundred years from now, when Al-Qaeda will be a few paragraphs uh, at best, uh, is this extraordinary phenomenon I describe in my book called the rise of the rest. The fact that dozens of countries around the world found a way to use this political stability, the economic stability, and the connectivity to hook into the global market, hook, hook into the global economy, and raise standards of living across the world. The, 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 you know, this is something that we, again, don't pay as much attention to because we, we, we have not had the perspective, but over the last 20 years, more people have, been, move, have moved out of poverty in the third world than in the preceding 150. Something in the order of 350 million people have moved out of poverty. Um, if you look at growth rates in places like Africa, in the, early, in the 1990s, approximately 25 countries in Africa grew at 3 to 4 percent a year. And if you look at it in an aggregate terms, the global economy doubled in, 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 in 10 years. If you look at 1979 as your benchmark, 1979, the number, number of countries that were growing at 4 percent a year, which is pretty robust growth, was about 25. Uh, it, is now, it was in 2006 and 2007, 124. So this is not an optical illusion. Uh, now, the, the question, of course, is, if this was all such a great system and if this was all so wonderful, you know, what about 2008? What about the great crash? And I think that the, the reason I call it a problem of success is precisely that we created this extraordinary new global economy, this new global society to a certain extent, but we had never done something like this. We had never, we, you know, it was the fastest racing car in the world, but nobody knew how to drive it. And as a result, it crashed. 
And the lessons I think we have to take from that crash are what did we get wrong and how are we going to fix it? And as I said, I'm not fundamentally convinced that this is simply about evil bankers who, you know, who, who took the, uh, large bonuses and that that's why we're here. They may, the bonuses may have been too large. You know, certainly, to me, they look pretty large, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is you're not going to fix this, you know, this system by simply focusing in on that. So let's talk about what it seems to me is the, is the, is the great problem. This is, the, you know, fundamentally, let's be clear, this is not a problem with, with business. It was a problem with finance. You know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Nike were all running just fine uh, until this crisis happened. This was a crisis caused by the financial system. Why did the financial system do this? Why has it always done it? You know, the, some, from the South Sea bubble onward, you have this history of finance screwing up, frankly, you know, messing up. And it happens in periods of political and economic stability when credit gets cheap. When that happens, people start doing foolish things because we have still not figured out how to outlaw human greed and human stupidity. And the combination of those two things uh, usually act in exa exactly this way. And so you begin the process of trying to figure out how do you reform the financial system to make it work better. And that is a often technical discussion on which I don't have that much to add, but I think it's, you know, the contours of it are reasonably clear when you look at the one country uh, whose banks have escaped entirely unscathed, uh, the one advanced industrial country that has no bank problems whatsoever, and that is Canada, which is a country Americans pay almost no attention to. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're almost dumbfounded to find that the Canadians have, had, had, you know, turned out to be the geniuses of modern banking. Uh, <laughs> But here's what, what the Canadians did. Here's the, the, uh, you know, the Albert Einstein level of insight they had uh, to save their banking system, which was this. They simply kept the old rules in place. Uh, the old rules were rules that were dismantled in much of the Western world in the last 20 years, which had been built, by the way, as a consequence of the memory of the, the old roller coaster of finance with its boom-bust cycles, which people seem to have thought had been outlawed. And, you know, it was basically higher margin requirements, higher capital requirements, lower uh, levels of leverage, lower levels of debt, uh, all of which were, in a way, shock absorbers for the car that was being built. I think, however, it's not just about finance, because the, the most important thing that governments didn't do uh, was take the one tool they had, uh, maybe we didn't understand the new innovations in finance and didn't have the right regulation, but the one thing we had, which was very powerful, was the interest rate on credit. Uh, and that was set too low for too long. And why is that? And I think this gets to the point that it's not really just a crisis of finance, it's a crisis of democracy. In democratic societies today, nobody wants to administer pain. Nobody wants to administer short-term pain for long-term gain. So, you know, William McChesney Martin, the great chairman of the Federal Reserve in the 1950s and 60s, uh, once said, somebody asked him what his job was. He said, the one line description of my job is as chairman of the Federal Reserve of the United States. He said, I'm the guy who takes the punch bowl away just as the party has begun. <laughs> right? Alan Greenspan saw his job as putting vodka in the punch bowl when the party <laughs> began. And it's not just Greenspan. Nobody wants to administer pain. You know, if you look at what happened in the United States, in Britain, in Spain, uh, even in Germany, it's when things are going well, what is the political system saying? It's saying, give more people loans, provide access to credit. What does access to credit mean? It means provide more people with credit cards, provide more people with consumer debt. And when you say more and more people and you keep pushing the system, who are you including? people who were marginal and dubious in their ability to repay those loans. That's why they hadn't gotten them until the government started pushing people, agencies to start doing it. And so you start extending credit to people who are frankly not as credit worthy. You start telling the agencies of government to, you know, to, to backstop uh, various private agencies to allow this to happen in, in the United States, most famously with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, and you do exactly the things that you should actually not be doing if you're trying to adopt a counter cyclical policy. You are, in fact, feeding the boom rather than taming it. And he, he, he has a fascinating irony. The two countries that got this part of it right were China and India. China and India two years ago, well, a year and a half ago, were in the midst of this huge boom, and 
They, they raised capital requirements on the banks. They told the banks to lower leverage ratios, and they started tightening consumer loans so that it was impossible to get a consumer loan in China last year. Uh, in India, consumption as a percentage of GDP actually declined during this boom. In America, of course, it, it increased. It went from 67% to 73%, which is in large part what all the problem is about. So you have a, a, a real crisis in the system, and it applies to our ability to deal with pensions, with medical costs, uh, with immigration, any problem that has long-term consequences, but where the, the, you know, dealing with it requires an administ you know, administering short-term pain is very, very difficult. And it's why, by the way, in my opinion, Europe, uh, Brussels is so unpopular in, in Europe. People wonder why. It's because most politicians make it their practice when anything unpopular has to be done to say, don't blame me, Brussels made me do it. Right? So the only way you actually get any discipline into the system is you do that. And then people wonder, well, why is Brussels so unpopular? <laughs> well, because for four years, all they hear is that everything negative that happens, but you know, if something positive happens, of course, it was never the European Union that did it. It was the local politician who did it. So that dynamic is very, is very familiar, and it is partly what is creating the, uh, this extraordinary erosion of legitimacy. And it's all part of the same problem. It's, you know, it's, it is, how does a democratic system deal, uh, impose some discipline? The, the final point I would make, or the final substantive point I would make, is that there is also here a, a crisis of globalization. Uh, because what we have done is we have created this extraordinary racing car, this global economy, this global society. People are more connected. And very simply, what we are doing is we are producing global problems, but we are resolutely sticking to national solutions. And you can see this vividly with this economic crisis, right? The economic crisis is absolutely global. It's global in large part because finance has been globalized. There's nothing you can move more easily in the world today than money. It's totally seamless, frictionless. You, you know, hit a couple of keystrokes on a computer and you can move money from one country to another. That's why, fin that's why the financial crisis spread like wildfire. But when you do that, you have to also take, take into account the fact that your national solutions are by their very nature going to be largely ineffective or much more expensive than they need to be. Uh, and you need coordination. You need, dare one say, global governance. Uh, but that becomes very difficult because while we've globalized the economy, we've globalized society, we jealously protect political power. And if you do that, you are, you're creating an inbuilt problem uh, you know, and, and this is perhaps the fundamental point I want to make. This is not going to get resolved because I believe we'll get out of this financial crisis. I believe, you know, we will get out of this recession. But we will still be stuck with this, fun, this problem, which is that you have created a global economy and you are creating a global society. You have diseases they are going to spread globally because of the nature of communication, travel. But you can't deal with them globally. You know, if you look at how we dealt with the bird flu, uh, it was a terrible example of what happened because Indo countries like Indonesia and Vietnam start hoarding information because they don't want t tourists to, uh, to stop coming to their country, people to stop trading. But of course, it's exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. Uh, we got lucky with swine flu, by the way, because the Mexican government behaved extraordinarily uh, well and really shut down their economy for two weeks, made it impossible to congregate. Uh, but, but they did that, you know, it was kind of lucky. The Mexican health minister happened to be a very smart and honorable man and did the right thing. But we're setting ourselves up for many of these crises if we don't deal with this problem. Finally, I, I just want to end on a note of you know, saying I, I, I don't mean to take morality out of this story. Um, I just mean that I don't think that it is fundamentally the driver. I don't think that human beings were you know, virtuous 35 years ago and they have become evil all of a sudden and that the solution is that we somehow, you know, find better bankers. I think that it is, it is a deeper, more structural problem. But I think it's fair to say that while almost everything everybody did was legal in this, in this you know, leading up to this crisis, with a few exceptions, I think it's also fair to say that nobody seemed to act with enormous amounts of character or a great deal of sense of ethics or moral stewardship. And I realize that sometimes sounds quaint to say these things, but I do think that we've got to figure out as a society how we get people to act in somewhat more elevated ways with some sense of a moral compass, because you're never going to be able to outlaw everything. 
you know, you're never going to be able to figure out where the next innovation is going to come from and what the next crisis is going to look like and what the next accumulation of, of, of debt or bubbles is, go is going to be that. It's just the nature of a very vibrant uh, market-oriented economy that there will be excesses. The question we can ask is, can the people that the, you know, the, in, in charge and the heads of large institutions have some sense of not just what is legal, but what appears appropriate, you know, what appears seemly? Uh, and if they were to operate with some sense of that, I think society would have a great deal more trust in them. I mean, one of the transformations taking place right now in the Anglo-American world is a shift away from self-regulation towards government regulation. You know, the Anglo-American world has traditionally had a good deal of its regulation be kind of informal rules that were enforced in some way by a guild system. You know, if you look at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, it is a public-private partnership. If you look at the, the idea of lawyers, for example, it's always been that they are officers of the court. Uh, if you think of accountants, there's always been a sense that they, you know, they are answerable to their profession and to, prof to professional standards. And of course, doctors uh, being the same. Well, if you, however, le let the system down, over time, self-regulation will disappear. And what you will end up with is lots and lots of government rules and, and, and arcane government rules, rules which have perverse effects, and you lose the ability to have common sense uh, prevail. And that's not such a great idea, I think. I think that it is inevitable that no matter what system you have in place, you're going to require some judgment, common sense, and such. So that's my grand analysis of, of, of what happened and how to, how to uh, move forward. But I want to close with just one thought, which is, you know, we started off with a global crisis. Uh, and what has happened, however, is a very interesting thing over the last few months, which it is now turning into a less and less global crisis by the week. China is probably going to grow at 8% this year. India is probably going to grow at 6%. Indonesia is going to grow at 4%. And around the world, what you see is that the countries that were emerging market economies that had begun to build their own internal domestic economies are actually surviving this, this crisis quite nicely. Uh, and the crisis is now in the old industrial lands of the West in Japan. Uh, and these new countries, free of financial crises, their banks weren't over leveraged, their consumers weren't maxed out, uh, are forging a new path. And so the grand story I was telling you about it still persists and it still continues. And I do believe that 100 years from now, 200 years from now, people will, st will look back on these times and perhaps even these years and say this was the moment that China and India in particular uh, started to move out of 400 years of economic deprivation and into a, a role where they became seen and perceived and began acting as equals on the world stage. Thank you very much. Come back in. Well, thank you very much for that a tour de force. Um, in painting a big picture, of course, you obviously are bound to raise some big questions. I shall resist for a moment myself uh, uh, putting some issues to you, though I hope I might do that perhaps a bit later. But if there are some of you who need to go for whatever reasons, now is a good moment. If you want to stay, we welcome you. We'd like you to stay. I us we usually do questions in clusters of four or five. Is that all right? Whatever you want. Yeah. To give an audience an opportunity to raise a, a series of issues. So if you could keep your questions fairly short, please. And uh, uh, that will be most appreciated. So let's start with the mic up there. Lady with a hand right up. Yes. Perhaps you could all say who you are. Yeah, that'll be and then way. a short question. Thank you. Sorry. Where's the mic gone? We, we were looking for a mic. OK. Oh, someone's running over to you. Sorry. It seemed to disappear. Yep. OK, my name's Vicky Tanner. I'm a demon banker who's recently moved to London from Singapore. So I have a question for you about the uh, nature of uh, um, government. Um, you made a comment that sometimes in uh, Western society it's, uh, it's very hard to make the tough calls 
particularly if you're head of the Reserve Bank. My observations are that uh, those problems uh, don't exist to the same degree in uh, planned state capitalist economies like Singapore. So is there a crisis for Western um, democracy in that regard? Thank you. Gentleman at the back. Yes, in terms of, <clears throat> uh, of coming out of the recession, how worried are you about inflation? Obviously with very low interest rates, quantitative easing, and with the temptation of politicians working to a short electoral cycle to inflate away the debt. Mm -hmm. Great, the mic, we have it around this way please. Good, thank you. Uh, yeah. You make a point about the, um, the mismatch between an integrated global economy and national jurisdictions. That's not a new problem. That has been um, a, a facet of global capitalism since its inception in the 18th century. And it's been resolved essentially by imperialism, by Britain in the 19th and early 20th century, and then by the United States after 1945. I think you're right in thinking that um, the present crisis marks the end of that period of American hegemony. But perhaps what will uh, replace that is a period of cooperation between major imperial powers, what Karl Kautsky described as ultra-imperialism. And the obvious um, imperial powers would be China, the European Union, and uh, the United States. The gentleman down here. Mr. Sakario, it's great to see you in London again. Uh, in the fall of last year, you were part of an esteemed group of leading outside thinkers that was assembled by Coca-Cola's great leadership. I'd like to ask you, what exactly is it that you are called on to consult, discuss, and advise Fortune 100 companies such as Coca-Cola, and how does that affect their international relations and global strategies moving forward? Okay, that's four. <laughs> that's four. Um, We'll and have one more, uh, yes, hi, you, and then we'll come back. I'll come back to you, I promise. Yeah, you've been American very enthusiastic up there. I'll get back to you. Yes, please. You're fellow American and fellow Yaley wants to know, what are your views on how the current global crisis could affect future political stability, given the severity and the difference in global policies versus... We'll just national. say that again. Sorry, I didn't... Uh, how do you see the current economic crisis affecting the prospects for future and continued global uh, political stability? Yeah. Yeah, great. These are wonderful questions. Um, let me answer the first, the, the, the question four first, which is, I, I, and I will answer it completely honestly. I don't know if there are any recordings here. So when I go to a place like Coca-Cola, I give a version of the same speech I just gave for an ungodly amount of money. <laughs> and that puts my kids through college. I hope that it, does, it, it helps them formulate a more uh, uh, benign strategy. Uh, but I, I don't leave out the part about ethics either, so, so they do hear that. Um, the first question about Singapore, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I first went to Singapore many years ago, uh, the, the, the government organized a little trip and took me on it. And at the end of it, they, uh, they took me to the airport and said, so what do you think of the Singapore system? And I said, well, I find it very impressive. I find that, you know, you guys are really, this place is very well run, and I don't think it's a kind of a soft fascist state. I see that people seem happy. The only problem is I don't think there's a Singapore system. They said, what do you mean? I said, you know, you lucked out. You got Lee Kuan Yew. You could have gotten Mobutu <laughs> or, or Marcos. So the problem with the, with the argument that, you know, a, a, a state-led capitalism is a better system is, it kind of depends on who's running the state. If you can make sure you get Lee Kuan Yew or any of his heirs, I would strongly ad advise moving to that place. But uh, you know, look at Russia, it's a good example, because it, it seemed as though they were kind of trying to copy some of those things. And in point of fact, they were, they were buoyed along with oil revenues. The place is a complete mess. Uh, they have made absolutely no inroads in creating a non-natural resource-based economy, because the state still likes to basically pilfer, plunder, and arrest people it doesn't like, which doesn't go very well with rule of law and contracts and things like that. Uh, it's, so it's very tough. I, I think the challenge is for democracy to get this right and to, and to find a way to discipline itself. Look, I think the European Union was one very commendable effort to create a balance between the, the requirements of effective governance and 
political pressure, it, it, you know, if politicians were to be a little bit more responsible, it could work well. All the liberalization on trade that has produced, you know, enormous economic benefits in Europe in the last 20 years is because of the European Union, uh, or, you know, all the standardization and things like that. So there is a democratic path here. It's just hard. On inflation, I myself am not worried about inflation. I think this is, again, one of the you know, fighting the last war kind of problem. Uh, we are, first of all, it's important to realize, this is now a technical point, but the, the, the central banks of the world are not actually printing money because what is happening is they are providing lots of credit to banks which are then sitting on those assets because they are trying to shore up their balance sheets. So the money has not really gotten into the system yet and it's very unlikely to do so in some kind of mad way because the banks are fundamentally trying to make themselves more viable, which means they're building up their cushions of capital. So this money is not just you know, pouring out into the system. Secondly, we're still fundamentally in a deflationary environment. The contraction in global uh, industrial output is larger than had took place during the Great Depression. The contraction in world trade is larger than took place during the Great Depression. You know, there are a few other signs of green shoots and things like that, but mostly the green shoots are really telling you the world is not going to end. And I think that's great, and it means that there's a return to a certain sense of stability. But we're still fundamentally in a very deflationary environment. I think the central banks are right. The, certainly the Fed is right to keep interest rates zero. At some point, it's going to be a very impressive trick to start taking away all the stuff that they've done. But I just don't think we're, we're anywhere close to that yet, certainly not for the next six months. Um, the, the very in, uh, intelligent question about uh, the integrated global economy. Uh, the, 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 the question is whether or not, you know, in a post-American era, you will have some kind of great power cooperation. Uh, that, this is sort of really the last chapter of my book. Look, I think we will probably have, continue to have, there are very strong signs that we will continue to have great power amity, by which I mean the absence of great power war, and the, perhaps even the absence of great power competition. Because for a variety of reasons, you know, I do think that some of those liberal internationalist ideas that, you know, that, that Norman Angel and people like that put out have taken root. Uh, people have realized that if China and America go to war, nobody will really prosper. But that's different from global problem solving, from global governance, from the kind of ultra-imperial management that you're describing. That you see very little progress on. The Doha round is dead in, the, in, you know, in, the, in its tracks. There's no movement on climate change. There's no movement on any serious issue that involves international cooperation. And that worries me a lot because it used to be that one of the, the reasons these things happened was that the United States pushed. And the United States had this enormous leverage because it had the, the market everybody wanted to get into. Well, tariffs in the industrialized world are 3% now. It's very difficult to lower them much more. And besides, people, countries like China and India feel like they have a huge domestic market themselves. And they are much less amenable to you know, making concessions for that reason. So you have the greater potential, the, the, the danger scenario in, the, in a post-American world is that you have a much greater degree of freelancing and countries feeling like they can go it alone. And then you get a, a slow erosion of, of this, this global economy and this global society and a retreat to a certain kind of nationalism and protectionism, uh, you know, which is, which is not, I'm not forecasting war, but is a, it was very different from the kind of world I think we feel in some ways that we are moving toward. Um, and what is the likelihood of this economic crisis affecting that set of um, conditions I described of pol political and economic stability? I, so far, I have to say, I think it's still relatively manageable. I'm impressed by the degree of political stability in countries that have gone through pretty hellish economic circumstances. If you look at Eastern Europe, Eastern Europe has fallen off a cliff economically. You don't see coups, you don't see revolutions. You know, at, at this point, we have you know, a, a kind of quasi-regime uh, change in Moldova, a weird coup in the Honduras, and that is basically the, the extent of political change we've seen. I think we'll probably see more, uh, and I think that you'll see some governments really uh, collapse as a result of this. Every government is in some difficult degree of difficulty. I think Gordon Brown would, would point that out uh, more than anyone else. Um, but I don't yet see, you know, the, the conditions that produce particularly great power competition, that's what I really worry about, because all this becomes much more difficult if you have, 
that, you know, the, 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 some kind of competitive relationship among the major powers of the world. I don't see that yet, but I, I do worry a lot because th this peace and stability was built on 20 years of benign circumstances, and if you certainly had five years that are like this, it's very difficult to imagine that it won't have a, a, a seriously negative impact. You happy to move over there? Sure, sure, let's go on. Yes, gentleman at the back, who's got his hand up very high. <laughs> sometimes a good sign, sometimes not. Okay, brief, don't forget. Okay, um, Bilderberg attendees often answer questions regarding the group by claiming it's just a harmless gathering like a golf club or a bunch of old men having a pointless discussion. As a four-time Bilderberg attendee, do you understand that there is a huge difference? Namely, that if my friends and I sit and chat about the world, we don't have the power with which to influence policy, whereas the leadership of government, industry, and media clearly can. Furthermore, do you recognize the people's concerns regarding Bilderberg and what it means for democracy, or are you just going to join a long list of other members dismissing and belittling genuine concerns? Okay, we got your point. Thank you. <laughs> um, Yes, down here. Yeah, Danny Kwa. Um, Danny Kwa, Economics Department. I wonder if I could get you to connect your hypotheses about the rights of the rest with the current global economic crisis, particular U.S. consumer profligacy together with the growing economic strength of the rest has led to a global imbalance where patterns of savings and consumption uh, have not been able to restore balance to world patterns of trade. One of the easiest ways in which to solve this problem is if the US dollar floated properly, fell in value, but that seems highly unlikely. The US political establishment is not going to stand for that. It's extremely unlikely that the US dollar will discontinue being the world's reserve currency. Is this an example of what you mean by a need for global governance, for a smooth transition to a more balanced world? Thank you. OK, gentlemen, who has raised your hand just down here. Seems to not raise his hand now. Okay, we'll come to you. And then we'll come back up again. Hi. Um, you touched on Iran in your talk. I wondered if you could expand on your thoughts of what's happening there, how that might play out, uh, particularly vis a vis the US and the UK. Thank you. Okay, yes. You two with your hands up in the middle. Yeah. We'll take both those questions and then we'll come back to you. Hiya, um, my name is Craig Willey, um, a student of international history at LSE. Uh, first question, uh, are you part of the Illuminati, Free Zakaria? <laughs> um, no? Okay, uh, never mind. Uh, no. I read your book, uh, I thought it was quite good. I thought the... the <laughs> <laughs> we're, still, we're still waiting for your question. Sorry, the title was provocatively <laughs> apt, but um, I thought it was just misleading in one way. Uh, which was in the sense that American military power will probably stay constant uh, or dominant over the next few years um, and power projection and all that. And so I was wondering um, whether the, the Iraq problem uh, will recur or will other nations uh, find a way to constrain other, the United States and uh, either way that question goes, is that good or bad uh, for the United States? Okay, pass the mic to the guy behind you. My name is Christos. I was wondering if I could get you to talk a little bit about your side job and your future, what your thoughts about future of journalism, newspapers, um, television news is um, considering so many newspapers, including the New York Times, are having financial, financial difficulties. OK, sure. so listen, before I lose the mic, let me just ask you one question myself. We'll, we'll come back. There's at least five more questions, and we, sure, you know, we'll do sure. that again. I was slightly struck by a mismatch between your sort of optimistic story of political stability, economic stability, mix in information technology, 30 years of sustained growth, and what you said at the end, which was some pessimism about, some considerable pessimism about the prospects of global governance and the prospects of resolving collective action problems. And it seemed to me there was like a disjuncture. I agree with a lot of the last point, but there's a disjuncture about the way you told your optimistic story and your conclusions. And it seemed to me what was missing in your optimistic account, as it were, was the way that story of growth and development has been fractured through power and struggles for power and resources, uh, growing inequality even around the world. Actually, if you take out China, the figures look much worse and growing poverty in the world. If you take out China and parts of urban India, poverty figures look worse. And now, of course, who are the countries suffering the worst impact 
of the result of this crisis is the world's poorest as well. So if you look at trend figures on inequality and poverty over time, they show a marked I increase in problematic areas, not the decrease. So what was missing, it seemed to me, in the way you told your story was the shift in power, the relative shift in power, which you write about from west to east, the rise of inequalities, the emergence of distributional struggles, the weakening of multilateralism during the same time period, particularly during the war on terror, the weakening of international law, and then, of course, the emergence of these crises, climate change, trade, and so on, for which there is no systematic response. The problem at the heart of that is a breakdown of the rule-based multilateral order, it seems to me, and the re-rise of sovereign power. Question. <laughs> That was the short version. You, right. <laughs> you notice if somebody else had asked that question, a question of that length, that he would have been interrupted three it. times. It's a, <laughs> some are more equal than others. Exactly. Um, on on uh, Bilderberg, um, you know, I, I, I've always thought that the people at Bilder, Bilderberg must. Uh, the, the first question, by the way, for those of you who didn't hear it, was about why, you know why I attend the Bilderberg conference and. Uh, what it means, and don't I understand that they really run the world, and you know, uh, all these people getting together. So, here's the answer. Firstly, not that it matters one way or the other. I've attended one Bilderberg conference. I realize that my name gets on these lists, but I am telling you, the, 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 in point of fact, I have been to one conference. Quite interesting. About 150 people, a lot of CEOs, some um, heads of government, foreign and finance ministers, some a few people from the media. Um, I hate to say it not very different from most conferences you go to. Um, you know, smaller version of Davos. Um, there are many of these all over the world. I've never quite understood why Bilderberg has attracted this sort of fascination. And maybe it's because they, uh, you know, ostentatiously talk about how every, all the discussions are off the record, which is a complete joke, because any politician who is gonna to speak to a room of 150 people and think it's gonna be off the record is crazy. Um, so I, I really don't know how to answer it. I don't know, you know, I, I saw one of these blogs which attacked me for it, somebody sent me, had a photograph of Madeleine Albright and Ben Bernanke coming out of a, me, a, a Bilderberg meeting. And the point was, this is deeply pernicious. And I'm thinking to myself, do these people not realize that they probably see each other in Washington two or three times a week? I mean, what, is it, what exactly is inherently evil about a former Secretary of State and the Chairman of the Federal Reserve meeting? Uh, I think this, you know, it speaks to a larger sense of powerlessness and a fear of some kind of cartelized conspiracy that is running the world. Whereas, in fact, the world I see is the problem is exactly what, what David Hell was saying. It's totally disaggregated, fractured. You know, the, if only there were some way to coordinate the actions of all these people. I mean, look at the Europeans with their response to global stimulus. If only they sat down in the Bilderberg meeting and said, okay, let's figure out a common European stimulus that will have, you know, so that we don't, each of us, in effect, fund our own inefficient industries and engage in what is, at the end of the day, you know, deeply uh, antithetical to the principles of free trade. But that's not how it works. They all do what they want. No, you know, then they you know, come to these meetings uh, because, why, I don't know, why do people go to conferences? I don't go to many anymore. Um, Anyway, that's my, the, my honest answer, and, and if you, what I would say to you is if you have a problem with Bilderberg, you really have, if you have a problem with a hundred other conferences you, you know less about or seem less interested in because it's happening all the time. <laughs> um, that very smart question about the imbalances in, um, in, in globalization that I, that I talked about. I, I didn't get into this, but the principal imbalance caused the financial crisis was, of course, the accumulated savings in the Asian countries, which then, uh, f you know, they had to put the money somewhere, they put it in American debt, that meant that interest rates got, got uh, lowered, and you subsidized Americans in their favorite sporting activity, which is consumption, and so thus begins the problem. Though you Brits did pretty well on that front, too. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right, that the, this is a perfect example of where you need some kind of coordination, where you need the Americans and the Chinese principally, but others as well, to get together and say, look, how are we going to not quite unwind this system, because you don't want to unwind it, you don't want to go back to and pr protected national economies, but stabilize the system. How do you create a greater degree of stability? One answer is that the, the value of the dollar has to go down. Another one would be the Chinese consumption levels have to rise, and that you know that is, an, frankly, a, a, a somewhat 
unfair thing that the Chinese government does. It does not allow its people to consume the, the, you know, the, uh, the fruits of their labor uh, and, and, in fact, stashes all the money in a way that if they were to ease up on a little bit, that would have an effect. And Americans should consume less. Uh, which they are already doing. And of course, now everyone's complaining. They want the consumer back in the market. But I think it's fundamentally healthy. But the fact that it's happening in this episodic, uncoordinated way suggests that there will be friction along the way, suggests that there could be another set of mishaps. And most importantly, you're setting yourself up for the next problem. Because when we get out of this recession, Asians are still going to be piling up surpluses. Americans are still going to be sp spending a reasonable amount. And the money has to go somewhere. Uh, and nobody has figured out what to do with that. And you know, the only point I would make on the, the role of the dollar is, I think some of it is happening. The dollar will fall. The reason it isn't is because of the peculiarity of the dollar is also the flight to safety. So that at a time when you think, oh, America is less uh, attractive as an investment destination, but you also think the world is going to come to an end, the two, your, your investment uh, 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 advice is contradictory. On the one hand, you want to get out of America. On the other hand, if you think the world is coming to an end, then probably the one place you want to be is a U.S. government debt. Because you know, everything else, I mean, either that or the Swiss franc, and there just aren't enough Swiss francs in the world. So that's probably why it's happening. Um, Iran, uh, very tough to know, to say exactly what's, what's happening. But my sense is that, that what is happening in Iran is somewhat akin to General Jaruzelski in Poland. Uh, which is to say the regime has lost ideological legitimacy. The fact that you have open dissent among the mullahs is a very big deal. I think you have to understand that this regime really was based on, on ideology. And the, this is, you know, we look at this as these quaint things, but they're not. This was as important to them as Marxism-Leninism was to the, to the founding of the Soviet Union. So the supreme leader is meant to have, you know, a kind of pipeline to God. And if he says the election is divinely sanctioned, that's meant to be the end of it. And when it wasn't the end of it, when millions of Iranians didn't accept it, and most importantly, when members of the clerical establishment didn't accept it, 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 it suddenly takes the, uh, the shine off this, you know, this ideological regime and suddenly fractures it. They will be able to put it back together temporarily because they have the guns, they have the oil. And because, you know, East, Eastern Europe in 89 is, an, is a unique moment. You have the three most powerful forces in the modern world. Democracy, nationalism, and religion, all arrayed against the regimes. But in Iran today, while you have democracy arrayed against the regime, religion kind of goes both ways. There were, there were devout, observer, you know, devout followers of the regime in Ahmadinejad, but the, but the dissidents were crying Allahu Akbar on the, on, the, on the streets of Tehran. And finally, that's a Bollywood song. <laughs> um, and finally, nationalism, which also in Poland worked against the regime because it was seen as a Russian imposition. In Iran, that's not quite the case, and the regime is actually trying to use nationalism to its advantage by getting into this absurd spat with Britain, by accusing the United States and Obama of, of interfering. You know, so, so it's a more complicated problem, but fundamentally I do think it will be very difficult for this regime to, to sustain itself in the way it has. Um, the CNN effect. Well, I, you know, I really don't know the answer to that problem, and I think that nobody has an answer to what to do about print journalism. The only point I would make is this. Uh, this is not quite like building stagecoaches stage in 1910, where, you know, where Henry Ford is building the motor car, and suddenly people realize nobody wants stagecoaches anymore. Uh, the product that we produce is actually in great demand. I mean, my column is read by 10 times as many people as read it when I started working at Newsweek because of the internet. Uh, the New York Times has 17 million unique visitors every month. The problem is nobody quite knows how to monetize it. Nobody understands what is the business model that will make this work. And I think that that's a real problem and it will transform journalism. You will probably have to have a more disaggregated, lower cost enterprise. You don't need you know, bureau, I mean, I find for Newsweek, for instance, we don't need as many bureaus, not so much because we're not covering the world anymore, but because there's this amazing uh, array of talent all over the world. And you, they write good English, they understand the rules of journalism, you find them, you, you know, you have to pay them a lot less, there's none of those expat benefits and all that. I mean, you know, that's part of the solution. You look at how Twitter enables people to get quick stories and videos out, that's part of a new kind of journalism.
But fundamentally, I don't buy the idea that people don't want to know what's going on in the world and don't want to read about it. Because, you know, look at all these websites that people talk about. All they do is link to stories in the New York Times, The Guardian, The FT, The Economist, Newsweek, Time. I mean, what would they do if you didn't have any content? So, yes, the content is going to change, but fundamentally there is a demand for the product. And there will be a period of wrenching transition. Some of these old institutions might, might die, but I don't think journalism dies. I think that you know, it, will, it will be look different, but be quite vibrant. And I've saved the most difficult for last. Um, so it's the mismatch between my, my sunny optimism and all these problems. But I think, you know, it really is because I do think that we probably see the world differently. I see what has happened over the last 20 or 30 years as, on the whole, an extraordinary uh, success story, uh, extraordinarily beneficial for the world, that all these countries that were m mired in poverty for so long have been able to find ways out of it. And inequality has risen in many of these countries, there's no question, as it has in every country that has experienced industrialization uh, in the history of the world. Um, it is simply not true that, that poverty levels have gone down. Look, there's a simple question. If, if GDP is rising, and if the population is not rising faster than it, by definition, income levels are rising. Now, you can say there's a lot of inequality, but you cannot have the quadrupling of per capita GDP as you have had in some of these countries and say that it had no effect on people. I mean, you may, call it, you may say that not enough was trickling down, but you also can go to a place like South Africa and see uh, what has happened over the last 10 years and see that there is a change. And does it produce environmental problems? Yes. Does it produ produce ecological problems? Yes. But, you know, I grew up uh, in Bombay but spent a lot of time in rural India because my father was a politician. And I tell you, if you have sp spent enough time watching, looking at rural poverty in Asia, you can understand why the Indians are so reactionary on environmental issues and things like that because the, the, the attempt to get people out of that kind of poverty, the poverty of people living in, on one dollar a day, is paramount. These people are, Jeff Sachs describes it very well, he calls it extreme poverty and he says, you're one cold away from death, meaning if one member of the family catches a cold, there is all likelihood that somebody in that family will die. If it's the, if it's the breadwinner, the fact that he's out of work for two or three days or a day, that's enough to kill you know, somebody or the other. If it's a child, they probably don't have the, the medicines uh, to be able to make it. That's, you know, to get from there to $2 a day, that is a huge accomplishment. It means that these children will live. It means that these, you know, these, these uh, families will have some sense of dignity. And so, yes, I'm willing to sacrifice a certain amount to get to that point. And at that point, I do think, you know, as, as this process moves on, you try to work for greater e equality. You, you work for that trickle-down effect to be greater. You work for greater common goods and public goods. But I'm not willing to say, until we can find a better system, and you know, having lived in India under the old system of, of, of a socialist economy and a mixed economy, uh, I, I, you know, I, I saw vividly how it works. Until we find a better system, I'm willing to live with the complications that this one produces. Now, I think that the reason I'm op that, I, that I described this process as I did is, I think we've had enormous amount of dynamism, we've had enormous amount of energy, we've had an enormous amount of, of progress, but it's all been uh, willy-nilly, haphazard, uncoordinated, and it's because of the, you know, perhaps the legacy of some of these past institutions that we've gotten by, because of the shadow of American power that some of it has, has, has gotten by, but it ain't going to last forever, and these institutions are wearing out. But I also don't have a romantic view that, you know, these institutions once worked because everyone was noble. These multilateralism worked largely in the Western world, and it worked as a response to the Soviet threat. And w once you lost the Soviet threat, these institutions started becoming more hollow, and it became very difficult to then find a way to genuinely expand them on the basis of positive ideas rather than fear. Every international institution that I know of was at some level founded on the basis of fear. And so moving beyond that is very difficult and complicated, and I, I, you know, and I hope we can. But I guess I, you know, I don't regard the last 30 years as having been you know, a, a terrible, terrible tragedy in the world and, 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 and you know, more terrible things to come. I think there were some great things that happened uh, and some problems that have built up that have to be dealt with. And I, I realize that makes some people think of me as an apologist for uh, you know, global capitalism, whatever that means. 
And I say, you know, if it's the alternative is being an apologist for I don't know what, global socialism, yes, I'm an apologist. <laughs> That was clear. All right, thank you very much. We have, time is running on, and uh, I promise not to speak again. So we have time for a short round of five questions. A short round, short round. Gentleman there has been waiting, yes. And then the mic to this lady in the middle. Yeah, you. Uh, hello, uh, my question is uh, basically, um, uh, I'm, I think, partial to economics than to history, but having said that, my question is, that you didn't mention the name of uh, N. Kondratiev, who has very accurately predicted the 60-year cycles uh, in, the ca in a capitalist economy, but the problem is nobody's interested in that kind of time scale, so people ignore it. My, the point is that when you have a capitalist system, it must go to a zenith, come to a nadir, and then start again, and uh, the whole thing repeats because, you know, somebody breaks out of the cycle with innovation and uh, jumping the queue, etc. So Don't that take is your one, cue from me. One the point. The question is and clear. And the second point is you were hinting towards a global currency. Okay. What have you got to say about that, Thank either uh, replacing gold? Thank you very much. Okay, lady in the middle. Hi, my name is Christina. I'm in the International Relations Department here. Uh, in your talk, you addressed uh, the sort of increase of economic and political stability and this growth of the information revolution. But from what we're seeing, it seems as though this, this information revolution is almost about to destabilize a lot of the progress we've made in terms of economic political stability. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Thank you. Lady next to you, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Apra. And uh, I know the focus today has been on the economy, but I wanted to ask about terrorism, another sure. issue. Um, the most recent attack was uh, in Mumbai on uh, 26-11. And uh, India took uh, quite a different approach uh, to the United States after their 9-11, um, uh, where it didn't attack uh, the perpetrators on their home ground. Uh, keeping in mind that the systems of government in both the host nations were different, i.e. Afghanistan and Pakistan, at the time of the attack. However, India's approach has not produced very effective results. Um, is, is there something that India could or should have done um, otherwise? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, too. And, uh, yes, uh, yes, hello. My name is Beverly Jurenko. I'm representing the Yale Club of Belgium. Um, and I think we understand from your book and presentation that America's declining and China and India are on the rise, but we haven't heard much from you about where Europe is going to wind out in this mix. Um, being based in Brussels, I hear widely varying opinions on how effective the European Union is, and I'd like to hear your perspective on it. And the gentleman just along from you. I'm just going to squeeze in a couple uh, more, but you've got to be short. Yeah. So my name is uh, Kasim Abuba Wan, and I am from Pakistan. My question is that uh, like you, uh, human rights champion, the United States every time takes a, a bold action on human rights violations, but it has to its credential the Guantanamo Bay, uh, the Abu Ghraib prison. Don't you think that human right is just a political tool? And secondly, that uh, terrorism is, uh, I don't think it has a lot of vested interest in it, and uh, it is not that there is Al-Qaeda which has no head or nothing and any, anyone who was just uh, uh, has a bomb blast and they say it's Al-Qaeda. If anyone throws a bomb, uh, you don't know, it can be agencies of any countries for any vested interest. And there is just one name, Al-Qaeda did it. Okay, That's thank you. Question. And I'm afraid that just, there's room for, I'm, a, I'm really sorry, I've, I've rarely seen so many people who want oh, to ask you questions, but we are running out of time, so this will have to be the last question. Yeah. Thank Enjoy. you. Um, yeah, Alejandro Martins, BBC World Service, uh, Latin America. Um, what about climate change? Uh, they say, scientists say that uh, the current level of emissions are only six or seven years until it reaches a level that is not manageable anymore. They talk about migration and increasing poverty. How worried are you personally about what happens if Copenhagen doesn't reach agreement? Yeah. Well, over, over to you. I'm, I'm very sorry for those of you who haven't been able to ask a question. We have taken quite a lot of them, and I, I wish we could take more. But you've got a, you know, several big issues to run yeah. out with. The contrariety of waves is a, is a more complicated uh, topic than I think I can quickly address. But I think the basic point is that there are uh, cycles of innovation. And it is certainly true that it is quite possible that these cycles of innovation are going to favor different countries than they have in the past. On the global con uh, currency, the problem with the global currency is 
you know, first of all, you can, when people say the dollar will decline as the, as the reserve currency of the world, you, can, you can't beat something with nothing. You have to have an alternative. And the problem with the euro, which is the obvious alternative, is that it has a central bank behind it that does not have many of the powers that you would want a central bank to have and does not have a central government behind it, backstopping it in the way that the, the Federal Reserve is. And you see that in this crisis. And so it becomes a somewhat weaker read. Uh, can you do a basket? I leave it to economists, to, but people tell me that you can't really create a basket of currencies, and so you kind of end up grudgingly stuck with the dollar. This is not a, uh, an ideal situation, because it begins to resemble the, the British pound in the 1920s, when you know, it was not that everyone thought the pound was the world's greatest currency, but it was, there was no other currency around, and so it stays around for a while. I, I myself do believe that the dollar's role is not immortal, but I just don't see it changing any time in the next five to 10 years, because you do need an alternative, and a plausible alternative. Um, is the information re revolution going to destabilize all this progress? Well, the information revolution actually, I think in many ways, uh, it just confuses things. It, it does disrupt things. But I'm not so sure it's, it's fundamentally destabilizing to the kinds of things we're talking about. Because on the one hand, while it's destabilizing, it's, it is hugely empowering. I mean, I've seen this in, in places in, in, in Asia, for instance, where uh, farmers are now able to use cell phones to eliminate the middleman who used to take the majority of the profit from their, for, their, for their crop sales. Because, you know, th th these guys wouldn't move more than 10 miles outside their, their, uh, their farms. They would sell to some middleman who would then take it and double the price to, at the big city that he would take it to. Well, now with the cell phone, they call the, 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 the guy in the city, the wholesaler in the city, and say, what is the price you're offering? So they know what the end price of, that, of those carrots are or that lettuce is. I mean, that's a simple example just of how information technology can be enormously empowering. Now, it does complicate things. It breaks down the old system. It means that you have to come up with a new one. But I, at the end of the day, I'm not yet, I haven't seen any evidence that suggests that it's, it is so destabilizing that one wants to wish away the benefits. I think that it's, it's a democratizing force and that has its problems, but it has an upside as well. Um, the terrorism question in India. Yeah, the Indians decided that they would not respond to the Mumbai attacks. Uh, and they presented it as an act of extraordinary wisdom and selflessness. And you know, basically the Indians were very responsible about it. It is worth pointing out that Pakistan has 100 nuclear weapons, and that it's a somewhat different problem than bombing bin Laden in his caves. So there was a, some element of deterrence also there. But I do think fundamentally they thought, you know, there wasn't a great value in getting into one of these cycles that they escalate and then the Pakistanis escalate, and they end up staring at each other across the border. Have they gotten much for it? Not yet, but I think they are hoping Look, the fundamental hope everyone has is that the Pakistani government, the Pakistani military, I should really say, recognizes that it's ex the existential threat to Pakistan comes from these militant groups and these, te these organizations within Pakistan, not from the Indian army. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the, until they come to that fundamental analysis, which is a very different way of looking at the world than they have for the last 30 years, you're not going to see any magical solutions in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. You're not going to see the, the, the shutting down of the pipeline between Pakistan and Britain uh, that is producing all this. Because there is a culture of, of, of jihad that has grown in Pakistan over the last 25 years. And it has been actively enabled by the Pakistani state. It has been actively enabled by the Pakistani military. And let's be honest, the United States and Great Britain smiled on it 25 years ago when it was when, when its efforts were being directed against the Soviet Union, with the Soviet uh, in, you know, occupation of Afghanistan. So we have a, a hand in this as well. But the point is you, you really now have, need a much more wholesale reversal. So the Indians feel like they have made a, a, you know, a, a down payment in a process that they hope will result in this kind of revolution of thinking in Pakistan. The, the civilian in, in Pakistan, I have to say, do seem to get it because they have no particular love for the Pakistani military either. I mean, this is a military that throws out the civilian government every decade and you know, puts them in jail and uh, on charges of corruption and things like that. So it's quite possible that you will see some movement. I don't know what the odds are, but um, you know, 20, 30%, not a, huge, not a huge percent, because these are long entrenched ideas. But if Britain pushes, if the United, the United States pushes, the, 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 Pakistan needs the rest of the world.
and we should, there should really be much greater pressure on Pakistan to, to make them understand this is not a favor they're doing to Britain or to the United States or to India, God forbid, but a favor to themselves, that they need to be a viable nation. I mean, if you look at, by, look at a simple statistic, literacy levels in India are now 68%. Literacy levels in Pakistan are 40%. They, they emerged from British India with roughly comparable literacy levels. So, you know, this is what the Pakistani government needs to take on as its great challenge, not, you know, the dream of Kashmir and, and, and running all these, these jihadi groups. That's the hope. Um, Europe, some, somebody asked the question. I actually don't think America is declining in quite the, the dramatic sense. I, in fact, think the first line of my book is this is not a book about America's decline, but about the rise of the rest of the world. Um, the, the, you know, but of course, power is relative at some level. The fundamental share of GDP that Asia is taking as it rises comes from Europe and Japan. It does not come from the United States. That is to say, the US takes up about 25% of, of global GDP, somewhere between 20 and 25, and it has done that for about 75 years. Um, the big shift that is taking place is Japan, uh, China and India are moving up, and Japan and Europe are moving down in percentage share of world GDP. I myself am a great admirer of Europe, the European model, the European Union, but I think there are two points to make there. One, the European Union is not going to be effective unless it can seriously embrace the idea of common policies on important global issues, because otherwise you're going to veer towards a G2, the United States and China. There is a real past prospect of a G3, I mean this informally, not in any, in any formal sense, but a G3 where the United States, China, and the European Union, which would then comprise probably something in the range of 75% of global GDP, would be able to set standards and norms. But there, there can only be a, a, a one person in Europe speaking for Europe, and there has to be a consistent and coordinated policy. And Europe seems far from that, and it's, it is the, the one great tragedy of European integ integration that it has not been able to leverage its, its commonality in that way. The, the, the other point I would make is, unless Europe gets, takes more immigrants in, it's doomed. Because the European uh, economic model is actually fine. I'm not a great, uh, I'm not one of these Americans who thinks that Europe is, you know, sclerotic. I think you do some things very well, like uh, pension reform in Europe has gone much better. Your healthcare system is fundamentally better than ours. Um, you do some things much worse. Uh, your labor mobility is terrible in Europe. But none of that matters if you don't have young people you can't sustain a, a, an advanced industrial state, and you just don't have enough young people, and you don't take in more people. And you know, this is a great problem for Japan and Europe, which is, I talked to this Japanese official once who you know, was telling me they really wanted to take immigrants in, and I said, well, do you want to take South Koreans in? They, you know, they, they, they would work hard. And he said, no, we have too many political problems with South Koreans. I said, well, do you want to take Filipinos in? Then he said, no, Filipinos don't work hard. So I said, well, what about taking in Indians, you know, South Asians? He said, yeah, we'd love to, but they all want to go to America and Britain. So I realized that, you know, he loved the idea of taking in immigrants, just not from any particular country. Um, and I think this is part, part of the, the problem in Europe. You know, the Europeans understand the demographic problem they face, and they feel like, you know, we would love to get immigrants. They just can't be Muslim. They can't be Arab. They can't be from North Africa. They can't be poor in you know, rural, backward areas. Well, you know, if you can find generic immigrants, it would be great, but they don't <laughs> exist. And so you get immigrants from actual countries and actual societies, and you have to find a way to integrate them. And that's the, that is, to my mind, the key, in a weird way, it is the key economic challenge Europe faces, because if you don't have young workers, you don't have anybody paying taxes. And if you don't have enough of those people, you can't sustain the rest of it. Um, on human rights, the, the question was about Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. Look, I think it is better to have standards and violate them occasionally and then be shamed by that process and, and correct yourself than to have no standards. I do not regard the, the fact that the United States you know, violated and abused its own standards, and I do believe it violated and abused its own standards, it, with regard to Abu Ghraib, Abu Ghraib or with regard to Guantanamo, is an argument for a kind of bizarre moral nihilism about it. Uh, I think it's an argument that we should be more careful in the future, but I don't think it means we should, not, we should f find ourselves uh, you know, unable to speak about what is going on in Iran, or unable to speak about what is going on in Burma, or unable to speak about what is going on even in China. 
I think that having, you know, hum the, the, the fact that you have governments around the world that will routinely jail, beat, and, 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 uh, and imprison and kill their opposition, often tens of thousands of people, is a huge, huge travesty. And it's something that I do believe people, leave, leave aside governments, should feel free to, to talk about. But that leaves you exposed and vulnerable to the charge of hypocrisy. And that means all the more reason to you know, make sure that your own house is in order and that you're trying to practice what you preach. And uh, you know, I, 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 I do think it's important to point out that the United States is by and large an extremely law-abiding country with a very strong tradition of rule of law. And one of the problems it's having in closing Guantanamo is that it would have to send these people back to countries where they would almost certainly be tortured to death. And that is one of the reasons why it has been more complicated to, to close Guantanamo because we do not want to do that. We do not want to send country, you know, people back to, uh, without naming you know, specific countries, countries where we are absolutely certain of what their fate will be. Um, the question of uh, Al-Qaeda, look, the, pro the, 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 the problem of every, uh, terrorism and every, you know, declaring everything Al-Qaeda, I agree with you, but the, I don't think, uh, I, the implication of your statement, statement was actually this is all being done by the CIA which frankly I think is nonsense. But there is a more serious point here, which is a lot of local groups that have very little, any, any real association with Al-Qaeda claim that they are part of Al-Qaeda. If you look at what goes on in Africa, you know, these guys now think that they're part of a great global movement. And this used to happen in the 60s when some bizarre Naxalite group in, you know, in, in, uh, in the jungles of India would claim that it was part of the, you know, was part of Che Guevara's Revolutionary Front. Uh, and that, you know, that's globalization, and, you know, it, it, I, but I think we should all take it with a large grain of salt. And the final point about climate change, and I'll be very quick because I know we have, to, we have to leave. Look, I am concerned about it. I'm worried about it. I would say that I do worry that we are not spending enough time planning for how we adapt to climate change rather than how we prevent climate change. Now, let me make it clear. I want to prevent climate change. I believe that all the things that, that the governments are trying to do should be done. Perhaps we can even accelerate them. But some element of climate change is going to happen no matter what. And I think that there are some very cheap, cost-effective ways we can start planning for how we would adapt to this. What if sea levels rose a certain amount? Could you create dikes? Uh, at a reasonably uh, a reasonable exp uh, cost in places like Bangladesh? Do you need to think about crop rotation in places? Some, some warming of the earth is going to happen. So even if we do all the wonderful stuff we're doing, we still have to figure out how to live in a world and prosper and thrive. The people who don't want us to do it think, well, you're losing focus, you're, you know, you're, you're admitting defeat. This is silly, you have to do both. And I think that it's very important to do to try to think about that. And my final point would be, in keeping with my glass half full Pollyannish optimism, um, you know, I do have tremendous faith that we will invent uh, some ways out of this problem. I think back to the doer English cleric Thomas Malthus who said, you know, population growth would outstrip food production in Britain in, in the 1770s and predicted certain starvation. And he was right, by the way. He was very, very good in analyzing the problem and, and spend, spilling out all the consequences. What he couldn't figure out, and what none of us can figure out right now, is the human response to those challenges. How will the hundreds of millions of people on Earth, how will the governments, how will co companies, how will they respond to this challenge? It's a, it's, you know, and it's the accumulated response of those people that then changes history. So, I do think we can, we can sometimes get too gloomy because we understand the problem really well because it's a big single problem, but we don't understand how human beings will respond to it because there are too many of us and there are too many of us doing little micro things that we don't think add up to anything, but they actually add up to a lot when you, when you multiply it by two or three billion people. Thank you. Well.